Last week, Dana and I were at a pastor's conference hosted by the Solomon Foundation uh, in, in the Bahamas. And so it's, it's rough, but uh, once a year we go to this conference that they heavily subsidize. They want to invest in pastors and their wives and encourage them. So we were at the Atlantis Resort in the Bahamas, a beautiful resort, had a, had a great time. Um, I could take my wife on vacation several times a year and be just fine. I, I love what I do. I love my family, but we had a wonderful experience. You can't see it here, but this is one tower. There's another tower identical to it. And then in between those, on the 17th floor, is a suite that we did not stay in, but a suite of several rooms with a full-time staff of like 12 people. It cost $25,000 a night to stay in that suite. Uh, incredible. We, we looked at this thing from below and was like, what is that? So I quickly searched on, on the resort's website and um, quite an impressive thing. I very much appreciate Matthew Anderson being here last week, walking through Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, verses 4 through 9, and talking about the topic of spiritual leadership in the home. And he left us with this takeaway that spiritual leadership in the home simply means helping your family trust and follow Jesus. Today, uh, we're in week three of our series, Out of the Dust, and in this series, we are talking about um, godly, biblical, authentic manhood. Next week, we're going to talk about the importance of hard work. We live in a world where many people throughout our world think that, well, um, the world owes me everything, and I'm not going to work for it, and there's, that, that's, honestly, that's not biblical. So we're going to be talking about what God's Word says about hard work and how we as men need to lead the way there. Today, we're going to talk about the topic of how a godly man treats a woman. This is a relevant topic for many reasons, of which I will not go into detail right now, but you don't need to turn on the news and watch very long or open up your paper and read very far before you will understand. The, the picture is not very pretty. Men have been out of line, and now we are, um, many men have been out of line, I should put it that way. And now I think the world is, is experiencing major pushback reacting to many years of some men behaving badly. But the pushback has not just been over the last couple years. Uh, this next screen grab is from a commercial that was in the Super Bowl in 2015. And uh, this lady here is a, a well-known comedian, also a well-known feminist. And in this commercial, it's a cell phone coverage commercial, she is talking back and forth with her friend about cell phone coverage. And she's walking through her massive house, and she's in different rooms, and she's saying, hey, can you hear me now? And I'm in my, you know, this room or that room or whatever. And the commercial ends with her down in this uh, birthing room in the basement of her house, I guess. And as she delivers this baby and hands the baby to the mom, she says, Oh, I'm sorry, it's a boy. And it's a fast-moving commercial. I mean, you have to kind of track with it. And I don't, I don't know if this is pushback against the sins of men or if there's something more sinister going on. But I want to start this morning and say to our men, uh, to our young men, to our boys in the room, that there's absolutely, positively nothing wrong with being a man. Okay? Um, God needs manly men. There's nothing to be ashamed of being a man. There's nothing to be ashamed of your gender. God created male and female, and he says it was good. It was, it was very good. There's, while the world may paint the picture differently, there is nothing wrong with being a man. This series is, is at least the title of it, is based on the verse from Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, which says this, Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust from the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. And the man became a living being. When God created man, he did so with a purpose. When God created women, he did so with a purpose. Now all throughout scripture we have examples of rowdy, rough men being used for God's purpose. Were they perfect? By no means. Did they sin? Yes, they did. Did they do a lot of stupid things? Yes, they did. But God still used many of them for his purposes. Jesus chose 12 men of whom many were very rowdy, rough, and tumble guys. And with them, he turned the world upside down in a good way. God still wants to use men according to his purposes today. And so um, that's what this series is about. But I, I need you to understand, you being the man God called you to be, especially in the world today, it's, it's important. There is, um, there is, there is uh, making fun of, there is uh, criticism, there is scorn, there is disdain for a lot of men today. When that happens, when godly, manly, authentic, biblical men are criticized enough to a certain point, many of them have chosen to kind of retreat 
to this uh, kind of a, a Neverland existence where they're tempered and they're harmless and they're maybe even at times a bit effeminate. Some men have chosen to go to that place. Being a godly, manly male is not even, it, it, it's not only okay, it's very much needed in the world today, now more than ever. I know that some men, um, some men have this fear inside that, well, if I, if I give my life to Christ, can I still be a man? If I give my life to Christ, if I am all in, if I, if I step over that line, give my whole life to Jesus Christ, is, does that mean that I'm going to have to temper my manliness? Does that mean that, that I'm going to be turned into a, a less than manly person? Back in the mid-90s, there was a book written with the title of Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Have you heard that title before? Maybe you've heard the catchphrase since. But it's been republished a few different times. In that book, there were two lists uh, compiled. One list was a, a list of male, masculine characteristics, and another list of feminine characteristics. Well, someone after the fact took those two lists and began to, to share it with a, a group of people and asked, which of these lists is Christian and which of these lists is non-Christian? And without fail, people chose the feminine characteristics as Christian and the male characteristics as non-Christian. There's a fear out there, and I, I think this is one of the reasons, a fear out there that some men have, that if I sell out and, and give my life to God, if I do what He wants me to do, if I live according to the Bible, then I'm, well, He's going to turn me into a woman. And ladies, I don't mean that as criticism, okay, but there is a, a fear out there that God is going to take away some of the manliness it's absolutely not true. You can still be a, a, a manly, authentic, biblical man who is rough and tough and who goes out in the woods and does crazy things and, and puts camouflage on and who, who fights battles and who plays competitively in sports. I, I grew up in the church. If you've heard me speak very long, you know that. But there were times in my life growing up where I would find myself in a competitive setting that was uh, also kind of a, a church setting or a Christian setting. And, and sometimes those competitions would begin with prayer, something to the effect of, Lord, help us to play hard today and help us to, to work hard. You know, but Lord, our, um, our, our competition today, they're, they're pretty tough. And Lord, if we, if we lose, help us to lose graciously. You know, it's almost like there's a sense of defeat uh, from out of you know from before coming out of the gate or from before the whistle even blows and there's a sense of well okay in order to you know play basketball in a christian setting then we've got to you know be be very cautious and careful and nice and and all that sort of thing and it it goes across a lot of sports in the christian sector at times if if we're not careful and i i, I think we're doing a disservice there there's nothing wrong with fighting hard and playing tough and going hard until the whistle blows. There's nothing, as long as you're not cheating, play within the context of the rules, right? But there's nothing wrong with, with going hard and being tough and being a man. If you're a Christian or if you're considering becoming a Christian, you can still be competitive and masculine and manly and rough and tough. You, you are in a church right now where you do not have to check your man card at the door, Okay? And we're hoping that as godly, manly, biblical, authentic men, that we can set an example for other men and young boys in an age where it's much, much needed, especially when it comes to the topic of how to treat a woman. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, and what we're going to be talking about is, is going to be different than what the world would say, because we're, we're followers of Christ. Because we're living our, our lives according to his word. And so as we talk about this topic, it is going to be different. Here's the first point this morning. Um, how a godly man treats a woman. Number one, women bear God's image. Women bear God's image. A godly man treats women as God's image bearers, not as sexual objects. Again, this is for those who are in Christ those who are followers of Christ, those who are trying to live according to God's word. Women are God's image bearers. And I'm going to go off track, or at least it's going to appear that way for a moment, and then I'm going to circle back around. It will it'll connect in for you. But I, I, I feel like I need to say a few things. Um, first of all, it is, uh, it is okay to take an occasional selfie, okay? Um, it's okay. 
It is okay to take an occasional selfie. I think we would agree on that, but do you understand that the rules for men and women are different when it comes to taking selfies? Okay, they're, they're different in how this happens. In fact, I came across a, uh, a selfie guide for men, a handy guide for men. Number one, hold the phone lower than you normally do. Number two, even lower than that. Number three, lay the phone down. Number four, stop taking selfies. This is a selfie guide for men here today, okay? Um, I hope that that may help some of you. That's how a man takes selfies. So, selfies are not as much of a thing for men, but for at least, at least as it would appear, um, selfies are more of a thing that, that women are engaged in. Am I, am I okay to say that? Is that uh, the next few minutes, I'm going to get a little uncomfortable here, but... Um, I know that I'm not the only one, okay? Uh, in fact, here's a meme I found that talks about this idea. I have a bad case of amnesia. Can you post 20 more photos of yourself? Um, again, it's okay to take an occasional selfie. That's okay, but um, you might know someone who, if you were to look at their Instagram feed or their social media feed, there's every single picture is of them. Every single picture is a selfie, and I, I, when I see that happen, I just, my, my heart hurts a little bit. I'm, a, I'm, I'm kind of a little sad there, because I know that this is a case where somebody is looking for something from somebody. Somebody needs affirmation from somebody else, and they're not getting it in a healthy way. Now, I know that I'm preaching to the men today, but ladies, God loves you just as you are. And there are some of you that might need to hear that today or be reminded of that. God loves you just as you are, inside and out. You don't have to be in, you know, have perfect lighting or have your head turned just the perfect way or perfect makeup or hair or the perfect outfit on for that perfect selfie to put on social media. God loves you just the way that you are. Can I get an amen from some of the guys in the room today? Yeah. I think that some ladies, though, have kind of um, figured this out, that the lower the neckline, the higher the likes might be. And I, again, I know that I'm treading on thin ice here, but it seems like sometimes people are interpreting those likes on Instagram as real likes. Oh, this person likes me, and I don't think that's the type of like that you're looking for. Um, have, you, have you noticed what your picture looks like and the camera angle and all of that? I mean, I, I think every, most people know the type of like that is being expressed there. I'm going to go a little bit further here. I hope I don't offend. But it, it seems like even on some occasions when it comes to Instagram or social media that es especially uh, some younger ladies are comfortable posting something that they would never do in the company of people who truly care about them deeply but they'll post that there and look for look for likes um, they, they're they're getting attention from guys and it's not it's not necessarily in a healthy way uh, pastor craig rochelle says this so many people are living for likes while longing for love i think that's true of the world today um, ladies again you you are loved by god just the way you are god cares about you the people who care about you that matter care about you for who you are, not who you may think you're trying to be. And so if there's a, been a season of guys coming along that are just knuckleheads and jerks and they're pursuing you time after time, it's like, what is going on? Why do I only, you know, um, I could be wrong, but maybe just pause for a moment and, and evaluate what am, what, am, what am I putting out there? What am I representing of myself out there? Maybe, maybe if you were to post some Bible verses or something on social media, and then, then a certain type of guy. I, I don't know. I'm just, just guessing, okay? Um, back to the men. Uh, guys, you know this. There are, some, uh, there are some ladies who will post those types of things, and you can find them easily on any smart device or computer that you have. And if they are a Christian and they're doing that, they're, they're, they're out of line. And so I would encourage you, men of God, man of God, sitting here today, uh, the best thing that you can do there is just simply don't, don't give a like to that. 
don't vote that. Let, ignore that type of behavior. That, that's the best thing that you can do in those types of situations. Man of God, it, you are in the kingdom of God, and you need to see women as image bearers of God. That's, that's how we are to see them. Any woman, your family members, your coworkers, the people at your school, your neighbor, uh, who every woman bears the image of Almighty God. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. In his image, every single woman is an image bearer of God. They're not an image to be oogled or ogled or, or even googled, okay? Um, they're image bearers of God. Now, when a guy gets to the point where he thinks that it's okay to look as long as he doesn't touch, trust me, it's only a matter of time before he's going to touch something. And please don't quote me on that, but um, it is, it's just a fact. It's how it works. If you're a guy that is in that situation, you've got to choose to stop the process by changing the way that you view women, by changing the way that you look and think about women. In Christianity, it has to be different. As followers of Jesus Christ, it has to be different. Job 31, verse 1. Job says this, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. Old Testament here. Jesus comes along. In the New Testament, we covered this in our Red Letters series in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, he raises the bar. He says this, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Again, this is hyperbole. This Jesus is going to an extreme to make a point. He's not literally saying, I've heard people say this. Should liter no, he's not literally saying you should gouge out your eye. That's ludicrous. But he is saying this is a big deal. This is how grave of an area this is. This is how significant. The stakes are too high. And when you're a Christ follower, when you're striving to follow God's word, you treat women differently. Now, if I'm talking to some guys here today that are struggling in this area, you, you need to get some help. You need to make a, some commitments to the Lord and repent of this sin to the Lord and say, I need to choose to see women differently. If you're going to be a godly man, seeing women as God's image bearers, it's, it's, it's part of it. Number two today, women are equal heirs. Women are equal heirs. A godly man treats a woman as an equal heir. Now, the word heir has always kind of bothered me. It's like I before E except after H and before RS, right? English just, that's one of those words. I mean, if you're a teacher, maybe you've come across that one before. But a godly man treats women as equal heirs, not as second-class citizens. A little bit of background here. In Bible times, Especially before Jesus came along, in Bible times, women were seen as property. Their testimony was not allowed in court. They were considered less than. And today, 2019, today, in many countries, especially mainly Muslim countries, there is a big restriction on women. It was just last year in Saudi Arabia that legally women were allowed to begin driving. Now, what we didn't hear on the news or read about in the news is most of them still are not driving because they are still legally under the guardianship of the men in their life, their father, their brothers, their husband. And unless their father, brother's husband lets them or authorizes them to drive, they're still not legally able to do so. Women can still, in that area, can still not swim in a public pool. Women in Saudi Arabia cannot try on clothes in a, in a clothing store, in a changing room. Because it's possible that a man might be driving by the store and look at the store and think, oh, there might be a woman changing clothes in there and be tempted by that. That's how ludicrous it is. I, I, I hope we can call it ludicrous. I'm okay with my wife and daughters changing clothes in a changing room in a department store as long as they don't have the credit card, right? <laughs> um, but there are a lot of countries where women cannot be out in public without a male family member with them. If they are found out in public without a family member, male family member with them, it's seen as if the, the family has kind of turned their back on her and she has kind of even been maybe turned out and is available for sexual assault. In Europe, 
I mean, you, you can find it fairly easily. There's a, an uptick in sexual assault in Europe right now because there are many people moving into Europe, European countries from these Middle Eastern countries that are comfortable or used to living under Sharia law. Also in these countries, uh, you'll see some pictures like this perhaps. Um, can we bring that one up? Yeah. There are many countries where women are, are required, if they go out in public, to dress covered in head to toe, other than maybe their eyes. This is a burqa, if you don't know what that is. The sole reason for this is so, so that they won't tempt a man. If women around you have to dress like this in order for you to not be tempted, who has the problem? The women don't have the problem. The men have the problem. You may have heard this. You have to search a little bit. It's not on mainstream news. But women in these countries sometimes suffer acid attacks or honor killings from their family when they get serious with a non-Muslim or go out and marry a non-Muslim. Women are sometimes punished if they're raped because they're seen as, well, she had it coming. If they break the dress code or they talk to a man who's not a family member out in public and they're caught, they will be shamed or even punished publicly. And it's sad, it's, it's, it's appalling to me that women are treated that way. At the same time, I am, um, I'm extremely grateful to be able to live in the United States where my wife and our daughters have the freedom to grow up and they can vote and they can drive a car and they can wear jeans and a t-shirt and they're free to worship. Do you know where those values come from? They come from God. Those freedoms, those values, they're based in Scripture, in God's Word. When Jesus came on the scene prior to, women were considered second-class citizens, and all of a sudden, things have begun to change. You can go all the way back to when Jesus, when his mom and stepdad take him to the temple to dedicate him. And in that moment, they're met by a woman, Anna, and she greets them at the temple, and she starts to tell, him, starts to tell everybody about this amazing Messiah and what he was going to do for the people. You can follow Jesus' ministry. And there are many women who were part of the group of 120 that was listed in the book of Acts who did amazing things for him all around him and served in significant roles. And then you've got um, the tomb. So the morning of when Jesus resurrects from the dead, the very first few people that go and, and give testimony or see this take place or see that he has left the grave and then turn and tell other people were women. Even in a time when women's testimony was not allowed in court and God says, hey, you know who I'm going to allow to be the first witnesses of this? Some women. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Paul writes this. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Race doesn't matter anymore. Everybody is equal before God. There is no skin color before Almighty God. It sounds very familiar, like something Martin Luther King Jr. would say. Well, where you are on the social ladder doesn't matter anymore. Everyone, everyone is equal before Almighty God. This is revolutionary teaching back then. When Jesus comes on the scene and begins to teach this, when his followers begin to teach this revolutionary teaching then, and sadly, it would still be revolutionary teaching today in many countries around the world. Countries where girls can't even go to school to get an education. Now, I'm not going to go down this road today, but I'm not convinced or satisfied that we've figured this out best in the church yet either. Probably a topic for another day. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. We talked about this a few months ago in February in our, our marriage series but um, it, it is a, I mean, it's a human scientific fact. Generally speaking, men are usually bigger and stronger and uglier than women, okay? It's just science says that a man's thumb can be up to 30 times stronger than a woman's. Science. And yet that doesn't make a man any better. It's just the way it is. And God is saying, treat her with respect, you may be stronger than her physically. You treat her with respect as an equal heir. Or your prayers are going to be hindered. God is calling men out saying, you treat her with respect. Or I'm not going to hear your prayers. 
Now again, this is talking about your wife, but I would encourage you, treat the women around you with respect. You use your strength, your physical strength, for her, not against her. I think one of the moments that uh, this is difficult for a man when it comes to um, just respect and treating a a woman properly is is at the end of the work day. Now, I don't, um, there are some rough days, okay? When someone hears what I do for a living out in public, oh, that must be wonderful. Most days, yeah, okay. But some of you guys work in environments that are dog-eat-dog world all day long. And you're putting out fires, and you're having tough conversation, and you're hiring people, and you're firing people, and you're trying to keep budgets in line, and you're stressing about this and that and the other. And then you get in your car, and you drive home. And you walk through the door, and the first person you may see is the woman who you've committed your life to. And if we're not careful, men, we get this wrong. And we unload our rough day on her. And so that's not how it should be. So I'm advocating today that whatever it takes, maybe men, on the way home, you pull over. And not at the bar. Some of you are like, I do that every day. No. (laughs) Maybe at the end of your subdivision or the end of your street, you pull over and you turn the car off for a moment and say, God, it's been a rough day. And when I get home, I need to be present. And I need to be the man that you need me to be and that my wife needs me to be and my kids need me to be. And so, God, through your Holy Spirit, give me the the power, the wisdom, the insight, the patience, whatever it takes to get this right. And maybe you start the car up, and then you head on on home. You walk through the door, and you see the woman that you stood before God, before friends and family, and you committed your life to. The person who deserves the best. You figure out a way to leave what happened during the day at work, in the car, on the roadway home, whatever it takes. Figure it out. And we live right across the street over here. You can see my house from the front of the church. We're, we're not going to be there much longer. We're moving. But I enjoy walking back and forth from our house because it gives me an opportunity. I don't always get it right. Don't mishear me. But it gives me an opportunity to just download some thoughts and information and walk into our home, hopefully with the, the right mindset. So figure this, figure this out. You've got to get this right. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. Paul says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, this is talking about maturity, this is talking about salvation, talking about reaching that prize, but I think in context we could also, in a God-honoring, scripture-honoring way, say, hey, you know what, at the end of the day, Maybe it's time to forget what happened during the day and press on towards the prize of having a a good, successful evening with our family together. Back to women in general, not just your wives. Paul encouraged uh, Timothy, his his mentee, his protege, to relate to local believers in the church as as family, as a family member. That's how we ought to do it in church. We're we're family. In 1 Timothy 5, verses 1 and 2, he writes this. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. The second half of that verse is is what I want to focus on this morning. This is good practice here. Treat every woman in your age range or younger as a sister. You want the best for her. Do so with, with purity. Take the sexual angle out of it. Same thing if you encounter an older woman at the supermarket or out, out in town. You don't treat them as second-class citizens. You treat them at, with utmost respect, as you would your mother. Here's the third point today. Women get respect. How a godly man treats a woman. Women get respect, not obscenity. There was clearly a day in our culture where it uh, was okay in our culture. I don't think there's ever been a time when it's been okay. But it clearly was okay for men to joke obscenely, coarsely, out of line, sexually, around, or in the context, or in the, in the presence of women. If there was a day that that was culturally okay, newsflash, those days are over. You know that, right? I, I hope you know that. If you don't know that or think, oh, it's not that big of a deal... Um, well, we may see you on the nightly news in the not-too-distant future. It's never been okay with God. I'm certain of that. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul writes this. 
But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people, for God's man, for God's women. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Coarse joking has no place for the man of God. It's been a long time, but I have been in environments where I, I, I saw women experience this, be on the receiving end or in the presence of some locker room talk, if you want to put it that way, some coarse joking, some improper things being said, and it's, it's disrespectful. Now, I am, uh, I'm, I'm not a violent man, okay, but I, I, I believe that if I uh, came to a situation where I realized that my wife or my daughter's we're being disrespected in this way, we're being exposed to this type of thing, I, I think that I would, uh, um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what I would do. I will just leave it up to your imagination, okay, and then uh, double it or triple it or something. But I would stand up for their honor. And so, man of God, women get respect. You stand up for their honor. Whatever the cost, you stand up for their honor. Number four, Women are treated with gentleness. A godly man treats women with gentleness, not, not physical abuse. It is never okay to harm a woman physically. No matter how mad you are, no matter how bad your day was, no matter how bad your week was, or your season was, or your year was, no matter how big of a loser you are, it's never okay. Don't ever lift your hand against a woman, ever, 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 never. I've heard guys say, well, you know, I mean, things got out of hand, and I got angry, and I was, you know, I was drinking, and, you know, excuse after excuse, or was she, you know, she pushed me, or she slapped me, or what, never, ever, don't do it, even if she stabs you, <laughs> walk away, I know we're talking about ex extreme circumstances here, okay, but I I've heard a lot of crazy things, I really have. Walk away. If you, if you do, if you hit back or you push back or you stab back, um, you're going down. It's just the way it is. Don't ever lift a hand to a woman. You've got to walk away. Now, I don't think that's the problem most of the time. It, it's pretty extreme that that's coming from, from a woman. But if you're a man, if you're, if you're a guy and you are abusive, no more. No more. There's no place for that. It is, it is unacceptable. You're a fool. I shouldn't be calling names. Um, no more. It ends. It ends yesterday. In Christ, there is no place for that. If you are um, a, a boyfriend or a husband, or you, you, I don't care. If you grew up, if you come from a long line of angry, abusive men, and you saw this witness for you growing up, it has to end. No more. That behavior ends today. You need to repent. You need to fall on your knees before God. You need to beg of his forgiveness. There will be a time and place to beg forgiveness of, of your wife or girlfriend or woman who, this is, who has been the, the victim of this, but no place for that. Ladies, if you find yourself in that environment, get help. Leave. Walk away. We, we will help you to the best of our ability. There is absolutely no place for it for the man of God. Here's the takeaway this week. Godly men treat women in a way that honors God. That's not rocket science. It's pretty simple. But godly men treat women in a way that honors God. Treat younger women as sisters and honor them and, and hope the best for them with purity. Treat older women with respect as your mother. Ladies, women here today, God loves you just as you are. I hope that you leave here... With that firmly ingrained in your mind, God loves you just as you are. Equal heirs in Christ. You deserve respect. You deserve to be treated with gentleness. Ephesians chapter 5, again in the context of marriage, but I want to look at the example used. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. Cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. To present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Once again in the text, who, who is our example? 
It's Jesus. What did Jesus do? Well, because we were in sin, Jesus went to the cross. He gave his life as a ransom for many. He paid the debt that we owed. Men, we're called to lay down our life for our wife. And I think in context, there's some areas that we, we can do something similar for the women around us in how we treat them. There are no perfect people in church today. I know that. Uh, Matthew said last week, he's like, if you're, if you're a perfect person, then there's the door. We don't, you know, you're not, <laughs> no place here. There are no perfect people in church today. We've all made mistakes. We've all fallen short. I hope you know that. But God loves us anyway. Jesus came to the cross anyway or, or in spite of, because of, while we were still in sin, Jesus came to the cross. He gave his life for many. If you haven't yet submitted your life to God through his son, Jesus Christ, today could be the opportunity. Before you leave here today, you could make some big, bold changes in who you are as a man. What are you waiting for?